It's important to remember that the pH scale is most useful for solutions that are weakly acidic uh, or weakly basic or neutral. When we deal with really strong acids and really strong bases, uh, we can increase the, the, the concentration of these by a whole lot and not see a tremendous change in pH. They're kind of off the, off the charts in either direction. The acids, uh, really strong concentrated acids become negative and really strong concentrated bases become uh, greater than 14. They give us pHs greater than 14. But there's not a significant difference between something that would be harmless and something that would be harmful. So that's why this scale is, is excellent for dealing with weak acids and weak bases, but not so great for dealing with strong acids and strong bases. So now let's take a look at some common substances. A battery acid, which you really don't find in a lot of places anymore in common batteries, except for car batteries, um, and that is in the car batteries is H2SO4, one of our strong acids. A diprotic acid it has two H's. Remember, only the first H dissociates 100%. Lemon juice has citric acid or ascorbic acid. Vinegar has acetic acid. And something that's not on here that I feel probably should be uh, is stomach acid. And stomach acid is somewhere between 1.5 and 3.5, usually. Um, stomach acid, the, the reason your stomach is acidic, that we want that environment to be acidic, is to break down food uh, quickly. If that acid level gets to be too high, you can experience something called heartburn. And it might be, you might think that if, you, if you're having heartburn, it would be a good idea to eat or drink something that's very basic. And uh, it's, I can't stress this enough, that's never a good idea. It's never a good idea to eat things that are very basic or very acidic. Okay, strong acids or strong bases. Uh, one thing that I'll turn to sometimes is just milk. If you drink milk, you'd think if, if that's going to help offset the acid, and uh, when you have heartburn, it must be basic, but it's not. It's actually around 6.5. It's slightly acidic, but that's a lot higher. That pH is a lot higher than the pH that's already uh, you're already experiencing in your stomach. So the milk will help to raise the pH when you mix it together with what's in your stomach. Uh, even water at a pH of 7 is going to dilute your stomach acid, and that will raise the pH. Really, uh, the most effective things for something like heartburn are a teaspoon or tablespoon of baking soda in water. That's going to have the same effect, sort of the same chemical reaction that takes place when you eat a Tums or a Rolaids. In baking soda, in baking soda you've got sodium hydrogen carbonate. In uh, Tums and Rolaids, usually the active ingredient is, uh, I believe, calcium carbonate or sodium carbonate, Na2CO3. Milk of magnesia, ammonia, which is NH3 and lye. Now we're on the very basic side. Lye is one, I would have to say, that would be a pretty dilute solution of lye if it's giving you a pH of 13. Anything over 1, and you're looking at greater than 14, lye is NaOH, one of our strong bases. Ammonia, again, is NH3. If you look to the right, I have a table here of the strong acids and strong bases. Remember, there are six strong acids. There are eight strong bases. And the big B, we call them the, the big B bases because they're big and strong, and they make a little b on the periodic table. That's if you look at the first element out in front that's attached to the OH. You go right down the group 1 all the way to cesium, then over to the group 2 and up to calcium. If you trace that on the periodic table, you get the shape of a little b. Want to review what it means to be a strong acid or a strong base. Strong acids and strong bases ionize or dissociate 100% in water. We've talked about that, but let's take a look at what it means with a great little animation here. You see the formula for this acid, this generic acid is HX. The H is what's going to, um, when these two dissociate, 
generating H plus, the hydronium ion, is what makes this an acid. The X would be uh, any of the six anions, okay, the negative ions that we see in the strong acids. Cl minus, Br minus, I minus, ClO4 minus, uh, HSO4 minus, any of those could be that X. So when we submerge this, we mix it with water to make our aqueous solution. If it's a strong acid, we should see 100% dissociation. And that's what you're going to see. And it's great out at the, for, for just an instant, you see H+. Plus, but then, this is a, uh, an excellent illustration of how that H+, plus, I mean, it exists for a nanosecond before it's snapped up by a water molecule. Uh, it attaches to a polar water to make H3O+, plus, hydronium. So as you can see, this dissociated 100%. That tells us it was a strong acid. Every acid and every base that is not a strong acid or base, so all acids that don't qualify as strong acids, they qualify as weak acids. Anything that doesn't dissociate 100%. All bases that don't qualify as, that aren't one of the eight strong bases, qualify as the weak bases. And what that means is, again, they don't dissociate 100% in water. So if you look at this, now the, you've got the H out in front of the formula. Again, they've chosen a different letter to represent that negative anion. That's going to be anything that isn't one of the anions from the six strong acids. So we mix this with water, we make our aqueous solution, and we should see less than 100% dissociation. And what we generally find is usually one in every 100,000, one in every uh, 10,000, sometimes a lot less than that even, of the acid molecules actually dissociate. And that gives us a much lower concentration of hydronium, the H3O+. Plus. Um, and that's, again, what qualifies these as weak acids. And for bases, it's the same thing. But it's a little bit different when we look at the weak bases. So I want to show you an animation of that also. For the base ionization, remember, anything with OH that's ionic, so if it's a metal with OH, like this, NaOH, uh, that's going to be a base. If it's covalent with OH, it's not a base. So we put NaOH in water, it dissolves. We say, we'll take a look at this on a, on a uber microscopic level, on an atomic level, and you see that this is going to ionize completely. If you look at the left, the animation, the water molecules, polar water interacting with the positive and negative charges. You look at the right, the levels of each, the NaOH is going down, 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 down because it's dissolving. And the Na plus and OH minus are going up, up, up at the same rate. So it, for every one NaOH or one mole of NaOH that dissolves, one mole of Na plus and OH minus hydroxide ions are produced. This will go 100%. The salt or this base will dissolve completely. Uh, and since it's 100% ionization, this qualifies as a strong base. Right? All of the group one metals and, and then the group two metals that we talked about, uh, the three of them, calcium, strontium, and barium, combined with OH, make strong bases. If we go back, this is where it becomes tricky, pretty interesting, and this animation is great for showing you how a weak base works. NH3 doesn't have OH in its formula, so how can it possibly generate it? Well, remember, the formula for water is H2O. We can also call that HOH. If we look at an ammonia, it has a lone pair of electrons that make it very polar. Okay, that lone pair of electrons, every once in a blue moon, is able to attract, like you just saw, a hydrogen and pull it away or off of a water molecule. What you generate, then, is an NH4+. Plus, and this, OH-. Minus. That OH minus is what makes the solution basic. And that's how NH3 functions as a weak base. I'll show you that here on the uh, diagram. Here's the structural formula for ammonia. And it's that lone pair that makes this thing basic. Because that lone pair attracts that hydrogen, pulls it away from water, you generate the OH, and that gives you a pH of greater than 7.